Hello and welcome back to the second module of this course on labor and decent work in supply chains. You already know how India's national or domestic labor law pursues two important objectives. The first of reducing the unfairness in negotiations between employers and employees and secondly to prevent conditions of work from being pushed below certain minimum acceptable standards. Let us now learn how international labor law pursues these two objectives. You already know from the last video that much of international labor law can be found in international treaties, including the conventions of the International Labor Organization. We learned about the role that the international treaties can play in the interpretation of national law and also how even if a country has not actually ratified an international treaty, it can provide some aspirations for the national law. Apart from the conventions of the ILO, a number of United Nations human rights conventions are also sources of international labor law. Of the many rights and obligations conferred by these UN treaties, some apply specifically in the context of employment, such as the right to equal pay and the right to join and form trade unions. These UN instruments also confer rights that can be applied in a variety of contexts, including that of an employment relationship. For example, Instruments that guarantee the freedom of association can be invoked by individual workers to claim the right to freely associate, to form and join trade unions. In this video, you will be introduced to some important ILO conventions and some United Nations human rights conventions. If you are interested in learning more about these international instruments, you can look up online the text of these instruments along with their supporting documents and the lists of countries who have ratified them. Now, as we did while learning India's domestic or national labor law, we will go through seven aspects of international labor law. Collective relations, wages, social security, conditions of work, the equality of sexes at the workplace, the prohibition of exploitation, and the training of labor. Let us begin with collective relations. As we have learned previously, the right to collective bargaining ensures that workers cannot be prevented from organizing into trade unions. Combined with this right, sound collective bargaining practices ensure fairer results in negotiations between employers and workers. Clause 4 of Article 23 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states that everyone has the right to form and join trade unions for the protection of their interests. Similarly, Clause 1 of Article 22 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights lays out a similar general principle. Article 8 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights of 1966 requires states to ensure the right of everyone to form and to join trade unions to promote and protect their economic and social interests, their rights to establish national federations or confederations, the rights of national federations to form or join international trade union organizations and the rights of these unions to function freely. It also recognizes the right to strike. The principle of freedom of association is also enshrined in the ILO Constitution, the ILO Declaration of Philadelphia and the ILO Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work. The freedom of association and protection of the right to organize convention of 1948 and the right to organize and collective bargaining convention 1949 are fundamental ILO conventions. They provide more specific protections to workers who want to organize into unions. They set forth, among other things, one, the rights of workers and employers to establish and join organizations of their own choosing without receiving prior permission. Two, that workers and employers' organizations shall organize freely and not be dissolved or suspended by any administrative authority. Three, that those organizations have the right to establish and join federations and confederations, which may in turn affiliate with international organizations of workers and employers. Four, that workers have to be protected from discrimination, including any requirements that a worker not join a union or relinquish trade union membership for employment. And five, that measures have to be taken where necessary to encourage and promote the machinery for voluntary negotiation between employers or employers' organizations and workers' organizations, 
with a view to regulating terms and conditions of employment through collective agreements. These two conventions are also the only two of the eight fundamental conventions of the ILO that India has not yet ratified. India's official position on them is that their ratification would require India to grant some rights to government employees, such as the right to strike, the right to freely criticize the government, and the right to accept foreign financial contributions that they currently, under the rules that apply to government employees, do not have. The Workers' Representatives Convention of 1971 sets out that workers' representatives in an undertaking shall enjoy effective protection against any act prejudicial to them, including dismissal based on their status or activities as a workers' representative or on the basis of their union membership or their participation in union activities. These are some of the important international conventions that set international standards for collective relationships between workers and employers. They recognize the rights of workers to form trade unions and protect workers against discriminatory or prejudicial actions as a result of their union activity. Some of them were ILO conventions and of them, two of them are considered fundamental by the International Labour Organization. Let us now move to the next aspect, that of wages. Wages are to be paid in legal tender, that is money, at regular intervals. Workers must also be able to spend their wages freely. This is what the Protection of Wages Convention of 1949 requires. The Protection of Workers Claims Convention of 1992 provides for protecting workers' claims for wages in insolvency and bankruptcy proceedings. This means that unpaid wages will be high in the hierarchy of claims against an insolvent or bankrupt employer. The amount of wages is also a concern for labor law. Several ILO conventions pursue the provision of a living wage. A living wage is the minimum income necessary for workers to meet their basic needs, such as food, housing and other essential needs such as clothing. The goal of a living wage is to allow a worker to afford a basic but decent standard of living through employment without government subsidies. These conventions consider the living wage as a key measure to reduce poverty. The Minimum Age Fixing Convention of 1970 requires ratifying states to establish a process to determine, periodically review and revise minimum wages. The minimum wage is different from a living wage in that it is purely a minimum set under law. It doesn't necessarily take into account whether that income is sufficient for a decent living. A concept quite similar to the living wage can also be found in the UDHR. Under Clause 3 of Article 23, everyone who works has the right to just and favorable remuneration, ensuring for himself and his family an existence worthy of human dignity and supplemented if necessary by other means of social protection. This right to social protection also connects the idea of a living wage with the next aspect that we will learn in this video, that of social security. Social security or social protection as we noted earlier in this module is a term that refers to schemes that provide benefits in cash or in kind that ensure access to medical care and health services and to income security. Illness, unemployment, employment injury, maternity, increased family responsibilities, invalidity, loss of the family breadwinner, retirement and old age are some of the circumstances when workers need social security. Article 9 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights recognizes the right of everyone to social security, including social insurance. The ILO conventions do not advocate a particular model of social security. Members have a range of options and flexibility to progressively achieve universal coverage for the population. They set out minimum standards of protection to guide the development of benefit schemes and national social security systems based on good practices from all regions of the world. The Social Security Convention sets out minimum standards for the level of social security benefits and the conditions under which they are granted. The Social Protection Floors Recommendation of 2012 provides guidance on introducing or maintaining social protection floors as part of strategies to extend higher levels of social security to as many people as possible. Several other conventions focus on specific aspects of social security, such as medical care, sickness benefits, unemployment benefits, 
old age benefits, employment injury benefits and maternity benefits. India has not ratified any of them. Let us now look at the international labor standards that regulate the conditions of work. The regulation of working time is one of the oldest concerns of labor law. Some ILO standards provide the framework for regulated hours of work, weekly rest periods and annual holidays. The hours of work industry convention that India ratified in 1921 and the hours of work commerce and offices convention of 1930 set the general standard of 48 hours of work a week with a maximum of 8 hours a day. The 40 hour week convention and the reduction of hours of work recommendation lowered that limit to 40 hours in a working week but India has not ratified them. The weekly rest industry convention that India ratified in 1923 and the weekly rest commerce and offices convention set the general standard that workers shall enjoy a rest period of at least 24 consecutive hours every seven days. The Holidays with Pay Convention provides that every person to whom it applies shall enjoy at least three working weeks of annual paid holiday for one year of service. India has not ratified this convention. The Night Work Convention of 1990 sets out measures that states must take for the protection of night workers, including to protect their health. The ILO Convention also sets out the principle that workers must be protected from sickness, disease and injury arising from their employment. In pursuit of that objective, nearly 40 ILO standards on occupational safety and health provide the essential tools for governments, employers and workers to establish sound practices for the prevention of tragedies, including reporting and inspection, and provide for maximum safety at work. We will now go through a few important ones. The fundamental principles of occupational safety and health can be found in the Promotional Framework for Occupational Safety and Health Convention 2006 and the Occupational Safety and Health Convention of 1981, both of which are designed to promote a systematic approach to occupational safety and health. India has not ratified these two conventions. Then there are conventions that lay out health and safety standards for workers involved in specific areas of economic activity, such as trading establishments and offices, docks, construction, mines and agriculture. India has not ratified these conventions. There are also conventions that lay out health and safety standards for protection from specific types of risk at the workplace, such as radiation, cancer, air and noise pollution, asbestos and chemicals. India has not ratified most of these conventions. The ILO also has non-binding codes of practice that set out practical health and safety guidelines for public authorities, employers, workers, enterprises and bodies that specialize in occupational safety and health. Let us now turn our attention to the aspect of equality among the sexes at the workplace. Clause 2 of Article 23 of the UDHR guarantees everyone the right to equal pay for equal work. Article 11 of the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women sets out the duties of states to eliminate discrimination against women in the field of work. The right to work for women, it says, is an unalienable right of all human beings. It requires equal pay for equal work, the right to social security, paid leave and maternity leave with pay or with comparable social benefits without loss of former employment, seniority or social allowances. Dismissal on the grounds of maternity, pregnancy or status of marriage must be prohibited. The ILO standards that relate to this aspect provide us with the tools to eliminate different kinds of discrimination in all aspects of work and in society as a whole. It also gives us a basis for applying the gender mainstreaming approach. This means that policy makers have to consider the different implications of any planned policy action on people of different genders. The Equal Remuneration Convention of 1951 and the Discrimination, Employment and Occupation Convention of 1958 are two fundamental ILO conventions in this area. The former ensures the application of the principle of equal remuneration for men and women workers for work of equal value. The latter includes any distinction, exclusion or preference made on the basis of race, sex, religion, political opinion, 
national extraction or social origin which has the effect of nullifying or impairing equality of opportunity or treatment in employment or occupation among the prohibited grounds of discrimination. It expands the idea of discrimination at work beyond the terms and conditions of employment and covers discrimination in relation to access to education and vocational training and access to employment and to particular occupations. This brings international labor law closer to the idea of substantive equality, which is wider than the idea of formal equality. It means that outcomes for equality are just as relevant as a rule that proclaims equality. The outcomes remain unequal if only people from certain backgrounds are able to meet the qualification criteria for a particular type of employment. For example, if the qualification criteria for a class of employees at an automobile plant requires a particular type of training or education that only men from a particular class possess, then the outcomes will remain unequal even if anti-discrimination rules are strictly applied at the time of selection. Both of these are fundamental conventions of the ILO that India has ratified. Similarly, the Workers with Family Responsibilities Convention of 1981 recognizes that family responsibilities are unevenly distributed among men and women. Unpaired care work is indispensable to the well-being of individuals, their families and societies and women typically spend disproportionately more time on it. To secure effective equality between men and women requires ratifying states to create policy to enable persons with family responsibilities who are engaged or wish to engage in employment to exercise their right to do so without being subject to discrimination. Pregnancy and maternity are an especially vulnerable time for working women and their families. The Maternity Protection Convention of 2000 aims to ensure that they not lose their jobs simply because of pregnancy or maternity leave. It provides for 14 weeks of maternity benefit. Domestic workers, most of whom are women, represent a significant part of the global workforce in informal employment. They are among the most vulnerable categories of workers. They are employed in private households and are often excluded from the scope of labor laws. The Domestic Workers Convention of 2011 provides that domestic workers around the world who care for families and households have the same basic labor rights as those available to other workers, including reasonable hours of work, weekly rest of at least 24 consecutive hours, as well as respect for fundamental principles and rights at work, including the freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining. Let's now look at the prohibition of exploitation. Article 23 Clause 1 of the UDHR gives everyone the right to free choice of employment. Although forced labor is universally condemned, the ILO estimates that many millions around the world are still subject to it. The majority of them are exploited in the private economy. The Forced Labor Convention is a fundamental convention that prohibits all forms of forced or compulsory labor, which is defined as all work or service which is exacted from any person under the menace of any penalty and for which the said person has not offered himself voluntarily. The abolition of Forced Labor Convention of 1957 Another fundamental convention prohibits forced or compulsory labor as a means of political coercion or education or as a punishment for holding or expressing political views or views ideologically opposed to the established political, social or economic system. India has ratified both of these fundamental conventions. The Protocol of 2014 to the 1930 Convention, a legally binding instrument, advances prevention, protection and compensation measures and aims to intensify efforts to eliminate contemporary forms of slavery. The exploitation of children for labor is another important area of concern for the ILO. The Minimum Age Convention of 1973, a fundamental convention that India has ratified, sets the general minimum age for admissions to employment or work at 15 years, or 13 for some types of light work, and the minimum age for hazardous work at 18, or 16 under some strict conditions. The worst forms of child labor convention of 1999 is another fundamental convention and requires ratifying states to eliminate the worst forms of child labor for people below the age of 18. These included all forms of slavery or practices similar to slavery, including forced or compulsory recruitment of children for use in armed conflicts, child prostitution and pornography, the use of children for drug trafficking and other work which is likely to harm the health, safety or morals of children. As you know, India has ratified this fundamental convention as well. 
In addition, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child provides children with several general rights that are applicable in the context of work, including the state's duty to protect them from physical or mental violence, injury or abuse, neglect or negligent treatment, maltreatment or exploitation, and the rights of children to rest and leisure, to engage in play and recreational activities appropriate to the age of the child, and to participate freely in cultural life and the arts. Article 32 of the Convention directly relates to child labor. It recognizes the rights of children generally to be protected from economic exploitation and from performing any work that is likely to be hazardous or to interfere with the child's education or to be harmful to the child's health or physical, mental, spiritual, moral or social development. Specifically, it places on state parties to the convention obligations to a provide for a minimum age or minimum ages for admission to employment, b. provide for appropriate regulation of the hours and conditions of their employment, and c. provide for appropriate penalties or other sanctions to ensure the effective enforcement of the minimum age and working hours regulations. The training of labor is the final aspect that we will explore in this video. Education and training are key if people are to be employable and thereby gain access to decent work and thus escape poverty. ILO conventions encourage states to adopt sound human resources practices and training policies. The Paid Educational Leave Convention of 1974 requires ratifying states to promote the granting of paid educational leave for the purpose of training at any level, general, social and civic education and trade union education. The Human Resources Development Convention of 1975, which India has ratified, requires ratifying states to develop policies and programs of vocational guidance and vocational training, closely linked with employment, in particular through public employment services. These six aspects are not an exhaustive account of international labor standards. We have not looked at the international labor standards that, for example, protect particular categories of workers including the especially vulnerable ones such as migrant workers, fisher folk and indigenous people. That said, you now have a good understanding of how international labor standards work. And that brings us to the end of the second module of this course on labor and decent work in supply chains. We first learnt about labor protections in India's constitution and India's domestic labor law. Then we became familiar with the system of labor standards found in treaty-based international law including the ILO's labor standards. Finally, we went through some aspects of labor protection under this treaty-based law. We are now ready to learn about some specific challenges to these labor protections that arise in the context of supply chains. Thank you for watching.